Hello and welcome to Cross Examination, the radio ministry of First Church of Christ in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Ryan Parrish, and I'm so happy you're joining us as we begin a series of messages that will be re examining some ideas of great consequence. In a courtroom setting, the cross examination is when the witnesses or the expert testimony is tested and challenged by the other side to see if it holds up. Is it trustworthy and credible? For disciples of Jesus, and anyone really, it's important that what we learn and what we hear is carefully thought through in light of what the scriptures say. And the more we learn, the better able we are to do this. I invite you to share in my journey as we delve into some important issues that I realized require a second look. This morning I'm going to ask you to turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking carefully at verses 1 to 4. This is a text that is so rich, so visionary, and challenging, because usually kingdom vision does challenge us. We need to adjust, repent, rethink, whenever kingdom vision is presented to us clearly. But the way that this is worded can lead us to think of something that I don't believe Paul had in mind when he wrote it. And therefore, if we're not thinking of it the way Paul had in mind, we can't do with it what Paul intended us to do. And so what I want to explore together is the language Paul used here connected to the way he and others used it in our New Testament scriptures and see if we can't get a clearer picture of what Paul the Apostle, who spoke authoritatively and wrote authoritatively for Jesus, really had in mind for us as kingdom people. First of all, let me read the verses. This is Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4, and I'll be reading it in the New International Version. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. In these four verses, just a handful of sentences, we have a beautiful call and a beautiful vision given to us. So let's begin where Paul does, at least in this paragraph as it's presented in the NIV. Now remember when Paul wrote this, there were no chapter breaks, there were no verses, there were no headings, right? He just he wrote. And so this statement is flowing from what he has already written to the Colossians. And he has already used a lot of this language in chapter 2. So he's referring back to things he's already written to them. And I want to look at those things carefully in trying to work through, so what is it he's telling those disciples back then to do so that we can work through how we can respond appropriately now? He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. So let's start there. Since then, now that already tells you he's, building on something else. You don't say that unless you're telling them, based on what I've told you, here you go. So, since then you've been raised with Christ. Where, where has he said this already to them in the letter? Well, we see this back in chapter 2, verse 12 of Colossians. Let me read uh, not just verse 12, but uh, let me start at verse 11 because he... In verse 12, we're in the middle of a sentence. He says in Colossians 2, verse 11, In him, meaning Christ, you also were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. This was, of course, a reference to Jewish circumcision, sealing an eight-day-old boy 
into the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenant through Moses. But he's saying that's not the circumcision you experienced in Jesus. Instead, he explains, your whole self ruled by the flesh, which is the NIV's way of saying the flesh. They're kind of flushing that out for us, so it makes a little more sense. Your whole fleshy self, we'll say, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now, this is where he explains what that looks like in more concrete terms. Having been buried with him in baptism, in immersion, in which you also were raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, what Paul's doing here is comparing the baptismal ceremony of entering into covenant through Christ watery immersion that from the very beginning has been the signal of someone's entrance into the covenant of the kingdom through Christ, right? He said, in that process, Christ himself did something to you. He circumcised or put off for you the old fleshy nature. Just like in uh, the Jewish circumcision of the older covenant, a piece of flesh was taken off of the boy. So Paul's making some parallels there. But this, of course, isn't material flesh. He's talking about a nature that is fleshly, that is selfish, that is rooted in the baser desires and enslaved to them. So, this is his reference to being raised with Christ. Because he said, in that baptismal picture, you were buried with Christ, and in that same picture, you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So, in other words, you have fellowship with Jesus in the immersion process. Fellowship in his death and burial, and then fellowship in his being raised, because you're trusting the one who raised him. All of that is God's kindness and grace. And we really do need to avoid any idea that when we speak of baptism, we're speaking of a work towards salvation. I mean, if you are willing to obey the Master, by going into the waters of baptism to enter into covenant with him. How could you conceivably see that as doing some great and noble work to earn anything from God? That's not at all how this works, right? God is offering you something you could never earn and you're willing to do what he calls you to do to enter into it. Immersion in the waters. And in that process, Jesus is circumcising you in a supernatural way. You're dying and being raised to life. So it's that idea that he's already given us in chapter 2 that he refers back to here in chapter 3, verse 1. Since then you've been raised with Christ... What now? What would be appropriate for you since you've been raised with Christ in that way? Since you're a new creation, as Paul writes to the Corinthians. With that old nature circumcised and put away, what should you do? Here's what he said. In the NIV it says, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, the NIV uses the phrase, set your hearts on. More strictly speaking, 
I mean, that's not wrong and bad, but more strictly speaking, the word there would be seek. Seek that which is above. The word things isn't even in the original Greek language here. Uh, it's If I were to read it really strictly, literally, we would read it, seek the above. <laughs> seek the above. The word the, the definite article there, is a plural in the Greek language, right? So it's this Adjective with no noun. We've, we've seen these before in our studies. It's the dangling adjective. The what? And so that's why in the NIV, and I think reasonably so, it inserts the word things because it's vague in general, just like Paul was being. So seek that which or the things that are above. What do we know about what's above? This is one of the things I want us to think carefully about in this cross-examination. If you read this and you're thinking to yourself what the apostle is writing to these disciples and therefore what we need to also do is to simply set our hearts and affections on those tangible things that are above in heaven. Or maybe intangibles. But you know, the the specific furniture or beings or golden street, you know, all, all the things that you might picture about heaven. Set your hearts on that stuff. Now, here's one of the dangers of this. Number one, the book of Revelation has not yet been written. John the Apostle has not yet received the Revelation And it's from the Revelation that we actually get most of our pictures of what is above, right? We have very little information about what is above. Even in Revelation, it's pretty limited, but that's the bulk of our imagery. So if Paul's writing to disciples who don't have the imagery of the Revelation to John... What do you think he's calling them to set their hearts on or seek? They don't know about the 24 elders on the 24 thrones. As far as we can tell, they didn't have that picture. Do they have a picture of a golden street? Probably not. What were they supposed to be seeking? Because seeking is active, isn't it? Set your hearts on makes it sound more like think fondly about. But that's not what the word is. The word is seek, active. So I want to encourage you as we're going to take a moment here and consider the word seek. I want you to think about what is possible to seek here on earth as mortal disciples of Jesus that is above us. What could we seek that is above, presumably meaning in heaven. Why? Because that's where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Okay, now just thinking on this language of seek, because in the Greek language, that word translated set your hearts on, that's the word seek, and I want to share with you some other places that same word is used and portrays more the idea of seeking. Uh, This probably will sound very familiar to you. In Matthew 6.33, I might Start it, and you might be able to finish what Jesus said about not worrying about what you eat, drink, or wear. He said, but seek first, do you know? Seek first his, meaning the Father's, his kingdom and righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. In Luke 12, 31, we have a similar statement by Jesus. Seek first his kingdom in the same context of not seeking after what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Jesus said, seek and you'll find, and he who seeks finds. This is in Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Paul writes in Romans 2, verse 7, that those who seek glory, honor, and immortality will be given eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 10.24, Paul writes that the disciples need to seek the good of the other, not the self. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 33, Paul wrote that he did not seek profit for himself, but he wanted the many to be saved. That's what he was seeking. Not profit for self through his ministry. He wasn't in it to get rich. He wasn't in it to get prestige. He was in it to save many. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul writes that love does not seek the things of its own. It doesn't seek that which is its own. In other words, as he wrote about himself, it's not seeking to profit itself, its own interests. In 1 Corinthians 14, 12, Paul uses the same word, seek, and says that the disciples there in Corinth should be seeking the building up of the assembly, the church, in a way that that building up process would abound. They're supposed to seek out the gifts and the, uh, the actions as a community that would build up the community, not my individual self. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, Paul wrote that he didn't seek the Corinthian disciples' stuff. He wasn't looking for their wealth or for anything they could give him. He said he was seeking them. He was in it for them. They were precious to him and mattered to him. In Galatians 1, verse 10, Paul says he wasn't seeking to please men, but seeking to please God. In Philippians 2, verse 21, in writing about Timothy as an exceptional person, an exceptional example of a disciple of Jesus, Paul makes the comment that generally people look out for or seek their own things. Remember, that's what he said love doesn't do back in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, but generally people are seeking their own things rather than Christ's things. But he would point out Timothy is one of those rare exceptions. He seeks Christ's things, not his own things. In 1 Thessalonians 2.6, Paul says he wasn't seeking men's glory or praise. And then in 1 Peter 3, verse 11, quoting from Psalm 34, verse 14, Peter writes that those who want to live the godly life, they must seek peace and pursue it. So as I'm working my way through all of these references to what people seek or ought not seek, I'm getting an idea of what Paul means when he says to seek that which is above, the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. See, this isn't about things, like objects. This isn't about the, the things you might picture in your mind when you think of heaven and its atmosphere. When Paul mentions that Christ, the anointed, that's what Christ means, remember, the anointed. He's seated at the right hand of God. That is a vision, it is a picture of royalty and of kingdom. Because you sit at the right hand of a throne. And who's on the throne? It's God. And the one at his right hand is his anointed one, his choice to rule at his right hand. The son of David. So if Paul is telling us to seek after the things that are above where the kingdom of God is centered, I invite you to consider that what Paul's dealing with here is not things in heaven. He's dealing with the culture of God's kingdom. Now when Jesus and John the baptizer used the language, and by the way, Paul picks this up as do the other apostles and disciples of Jesus in the scriptures, when they reference the kingdom of God, they're saying that it is the kingdom rooted in the kingship of God. It is the king's dominion. That's where the word kingdom comes from. King, dom, king, dominion. So the, the dominion of God is his kingdom. 
It is rooted in his kingship, which is represented by his throne, and his son, his anointed one, is seated there at his right hand, ruling with him. As Jesus said to one of his churches in Revelation, he overcame, and so the Father gave him a place on his throne. Now, think of that now. When Paul says, seek after the things that are above where Christ is seated at God's right hand. Because what we're talking about now is not objects or things or environment of heaven. We're talking about culture. Seek the culture of God's kingdom. Rooted in heaven itself, yes. Or originating in heaven itself, yes. Just as the kingdom of God that has come is rooted and originating in the heavenly city of God. But it's not located there. I think that's my main point here. Paul's not talking about things located in heaven. He's talking about things that flow from heaven right here on earth. And that's why I think this needs a cross-examination. This needs a reconsideration. If you read Colossians 3 verse 1, and you're thinking that Paul means you need to sit around all day and pine away for heaven, I think you're missing entirely his point. That pining away is not helpful to the mission of Christ. Seeking, remember is not just pining, wishing you could have. Seeking is actively going to get it, right? To uncover where it is and have it. How do you seek things that are in heaven itself? What we're seeking while we're here on earth is the culture of the heavenly kingdom. And as you read Paul's letter to the Colossians from beginning to end, but particularly from chapter 3 forward where he begins to give very practical commands and instructions and counsel, you can see how you could actively seek out the kingdom culture of God's heaven as it invades earth. And as the disciples of Jesus seek out that culture, by the way, they begin to do things that Paul wrote pretty naturally because the kingdom of heaven has a very particular culture that Jesus himself not only spoke but exemplified. That's what we're seeking. What else could Jesus have meant by seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? That is culture. That's the way God works and the way his society in his kingdom works. It's about how to love people, even your enemies. It's how to pray for those who persecute you. It's about being so pure in heart and loyalty towards your spouse that you don't even look at that woman to lust after her and so commit adultery with her in your heart. It's about being the kind of person that isn't angry anymore at at people. You're slow to anger and abounding in love because that's the culture of your king. He's merciful and compassionate. That's the culture. And so that's what the citizens of the kingdom need to have as their culture. That's what we're seeking when Paul says to seek the things that are above because those things are invading earth through Christ, his gospel, his spirit, and his living body, the church. The fact that he's seated at God's right hand is not just Paul describing one detail of the heavenly environment. That is a declaration of kingdom. And I really want to make sure we know that kingdom has culture, and that culture is invading the culture of earth. Whichever culture you're in, If you're a disciple and belong to an assembly of disciples, the culture of the kingdom of heaven is meant to be infiltrating the culture that you are in because you died with Christ. Isn't that beautiful? 
You died with Christ to the culture of the kingdom of darkness, and now you need to be seeking out the things of the kingdom culture to which you now belong. So look at verse 2 now. In the NIV, it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And again, it just seems so obvious that this means that I just need to sit around and ponder heavenly visions all day. Visions of clouds or of harps or of angels flying around or however you picture it. How would they have pictured it before the revelation is given to John? What, what pictures would they have had in their minds? How much could they ponder, really? So what did Paul mean when he wrote what he did here in verse 2? Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Well, first of all, let's consider the language of what set your minds really is here. The word here in the Greek language is actually hard to communicate succinctly in English. And so I really don't begrudge what the uh, NIV translators did here or what other translators do. It's a tough word to get across in whatever context you find it. But if, if I could try to present some handy ways to think of this idea, it would be to purposefully direct your thinking toward. So set your mind on. That actually works pretty well, I think. But this has to do with actively concentrating on something, right? Uh, Again, the language, I I liked what somebody else said about this in one of my resources. It said, direct your mind to it. And, And by the way, you know, as well as I do, your mind needs direction, if it's going to focus for very long on just about anything. Anybody else struggle a lot of times in prayer when your mind is just going all over the place? I can be actually really focused on God and calling out to Him and listening for His voice, and something will come up in that conversation with my king, and my mind will just take that one thing and go, and I don't know where it ends up, but after a couple of minutes I realize... I am no longer thinking about my conversation with God. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of everything else but. And, and we know this about our minds. Our minds are very complex. They work very fast. And you can try to piece together the train of thought. I like the way we use that phrase, train of thought, because there are so many cars linking, right? <laughs> like how do, This is a long train of thought that I don't even know what some of those cars are in between the caboose and the engine. I, you know, I, I really can't remember how I got to this place that I'm thinking about right now. See, that is a testimony that what Paul wrote here, this word that Paul uses here, is, is so crucial. By the way, this word could mean an opinion. How could this word mean opinion? It's because you have formulated thoughts based on your directed thoughts. So you were thinking hard and purposefully about something, and you came up with an opinion about it. Right. So it could be the outcome of the process. It could be the process itself. And so what Paul is really calling the disciples of Jesus to do, which if you are a disciple, he's calling you to do this on Jesus' behalf, in Jesus' authority. As someone who has been raised with Christ, you are being called by your master to purposefully direct your thinking towards that which is above, not on earthly things. Now, here again, it's so easy to just think, okay, ponder heaven, forget about stuff here on earth. That is not at all consistent with what Jesus, the apostles, or Paul ever did or commanded. So if not that, what is Paul saying? He's actually saying something almost identical to what he said back in verse 1. Set your minds to purposefully Focus on, ponder, and meditate on the kingdom culture. Yes, it's in heaven, but we don't know much about heaven. We do know the culture of heaven, though, because of what God gave to Israel in the law. So much of that tells you the culture of the heavenly kingdom that has invaded earth. But especially 
Most fully, we see it in Jesus, his life, his teachings, and that of the apostles, the writings of the apostles in our New Testament scriptures. We know the kingdom culture, even if we, including the pictures in the Revelation, even if we don't have that clear a picture of what heaven itself is like, we do know what its culture is like. And that's what we're meant to set our minds on, fix our minds on. Not on the things of earth. Again, the word things is not in there. It's the vague fill-in word. And I really want to stress this. I really think that the missing word there, the, the vagueness there that they try to capture with the word things, that's culture. That's the culture of the earth, which, remember, is the culture of the dark kingdom that has had its established dominion on earth in the affairs of humankind since Adam and Eve rebelled against God. The usurper Satan has built a kingdom with a lot of kingdoms under its umbrella throughout the earth for millennia. The invasion of God's kingdom that was announced and inaugurated in Christ and then carried on through his apostles and the assemblies of his disciples from there. That is now puncturing with heaven's culture, the culture that has been rooted in earthly concerns all this time. Now, as we move on to verse 3, he not only emphasizes that you've been raised with Christ, he draws us back to the idea that you died with Christ. It's your fellowship with Christ who is seated at God's right hand, who is at home in the heavenly culture. It's your fellowship with him that demands you focus and seek after and, and direct your mind toward the culture of heaven. Because if Jesus, our master, is at home in that culture, we must become at home in that culture. No longer at home in the earthly, dark, dominion culture of our enemy. No, those things are becoming detestable to us as we grow and mature. Those things are becoming distasteful to us as we grow and mature. We, we can't have fellowship with those things in the darkness because we are people of the light. Not in a snobbish way, but in an honest way. With no pretense, no arrogance. See, this is, a, this is a matter of a transformed nature that can no longer take part in things it used to relish and enjoy. Now, as we grow as disciples, there are going to be things we still really, really want to do and still really, really enjoy that we will choose by the help of the Holy Spirit to exert true and powerful self-control and say no to ungodliness. Say yes to righteousness. I mean, that's going to be a part of our process. But what I'm saying is that growing, that maturing leads us to the place where it's not so hard forever. We actually get to the place where it would be hard to give in to that temptation because I honestly just don't want that anymore. That's our goal, is to be so utterly transformed into the nature of Christ that we desire and seek after and we direct our minds to the things of his culture, not the culture of earth. Now, as I mentioned, Paul says at the beginning of verse 3, for you died, as if to explain why what he's commanding in verses 1 and 2 makes sense. Not only because you were raised with Christ, but because you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, has he mentioned this idea of them dying already? Yes, back in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Let me read this for you. It says, since you died with Christ, and he kind of hinted at that in that earlier passage I read about being buried with Christ in their baptism. I mean, that kind of implies death, doesn't it? Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, and that actually I really appreciate the way the NIV words that because this is another tough one to 
communicate into English real clearly. The idea here of the elemental spiritual forces, this has to do with the order of things. So in other words, you died to the way things operate in the world. And by world, we don't mean God's beautiful created planet. We're talking about the world system. So you died to the way things operate in this world system. So again, going back to Colossians 2 verse 20, since you died with Christ to the order of things in this world system, why as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to its rules? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. And Paul is telling them they have a freedom far beyond these rules that are really powerless to transform anybody and give them a heart that is free of these desires and slavery to them. So Paul's already established just a few sentences before chapter 3 begins that they've died with Christ to the way this world operates. It's system. So, in chapter 3, verse 3, picking up on that same idea, he says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And where is Christ? He already told us in verse 1, seated above at God's right hand. If your life is hidden with Christ in God, where is your life hidden? Above, at God's right hand. That's where your life is. Securely kept, securely protected, and enriched. I want to remind you what Paul wrote to the Ephesians, that in Christ... The Father has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Christ. Above. Same ideas. Our life is hidden with Christ in God above, and it's in that same reality that we've received every spiritual blessing in Christ, in the heavenly realms. We've been seated with Christ, Paul said. Like he's writing that in the present tense 2,000 years ago, as if it was already true. We've been seated with Christ. How? Because we were raised with Christ. Why? Because we died with Christ. Our fellowship with Jesus is so full that as he sits at the right hand of the Father and our lives are hidden away with him, we are there in a very real way. And it might be that the vision John does eventually receive of 24 elders on 24 thrones around the throne of God, it might be a bit of a picture of the fact that human beings who are brought into the kingdom of God, whose lives are hidden away with Christ and God above at God's right hand, who are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, Maybe there's a bit of a picture there that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In some way, even while we're mortals here on earth, there's something to this picture that Paul paints for us. What a vision to live from, right? What a vision to live out of in this mortal fallen world. Because we're in it, but we're not of it. That's what Jesus said to his first disciples just shortly before he goes into his arrest and false trials and suffering and death and eventual resurrection. Jesus said to them that they were in the world, but not of it. Now, if they're not of the world, they're of something else. Yes, they're of a heavenly kingdom. How can you be physically in the world but be of a heavenly kingdom? It's because the heavenly kingdom is invading. So physically, you're here on earth as the invasion force. 
But your true life, your true identity, your, as Paul says in Philippians, citizenship, your mental view of things, all of that is rooted in the heavenly culture and therefore in the heaven, and therefore in heaven itself. You know, there's no room for this so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good stuff, okay? That's, that's not Paul's purpose, and that's not Paul's vision. Paul is talking about being the most powerful and effective force we can be for the kingdom of God here in this world because we understand where our life really is. See, you're going to become fearless, disciple, when you know that your life is secure, hidden away with Christ in God. That this mortal bodily life that you have isn't your fullest, grandest life. That you don't have to be constantly doing everything possible to preserve it and protect it. That you could be what others consider reckless in your service to God, where you might be, as they see it, throwing your life away to do what you know your Father's calling you to do, just like your Master, by the way, certainly looked like he was throwing his life away. The Apostle Paul looked like he was throwing his life away as he continued to move on towards Jerusalem, even though he knew this wasn't going to end well. All of the apostles, minus Judas, and including his replacement, all of the apostles threw their lives away from the earthly point of view. But they could walk in confidence that their life was secure. Why? Because their life was hidden with Christ in God. This is the same confidence that allows us to use our wealth and resources to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy, thieves don't break in and steal, rather than storing up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust do destroy and thieves do break in and steal. It's the confidence Paul expressed to Timothy when he said he knows that his father can keep what he's entrusted to him until that day. It's safe. It's secure. So go ahead. Obey with abandon. Be generous with abandon. The, the calculus of heaven is different than the calculus of earth, and that's why we need to seek out the culture of heaven. We need to direct our minds towards the way that the kingdom of God works, not the way that this world works. Because if you operate by the rules of earth, you can't feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, right? That's fuzzy math. And you can't walk on water. That doesn't work. You can't raise dead people just by talking to them. That doesn't work, right? Right? You can't cast out demons just by speaking to them in this man Jesus' name. That doesn't work. It's not how things happen. And yet, when the kingdom culture of God rooted in his heavenly domain, when that invades suddenly, yeah, that does happen. And the examples don't stop in the scriptural picture of the first century church either. If you haven't experienced it yet, you probably know someone who has. Where God provided for your need in a way that did not add up in the normal way of the world, in the order of the world. But see, you died to that order of the world and you entered into a whole new realm of kingdom possibilities. Now, yes, gravity is still in effect. And yes, I still need to put gas in my car. And yes, I still need to eat nutritious food if my body is going to have the greatest benefit. I'm not saying all the rules of God's created order don't apply anymore. What I'm saying is it is no longer limited to what my five senses can experience in the normal pattern of things. Because the kingdom is ruled by the creator. And the creator has every option available 
and has the freedom to choose any of the options that he would like. You've been raised with Christ and you died with Christ and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. One more thought about this before we move on to the last verse for the morning. Jesus said to his disciples, and you can read about this in Matthew 16, that the one who wants to save his soul or his life or his self will lose it. But the one who loses his life or soul or self for Jesus will find it. It reminds me of what Jesus said about those who trust him. They've crossed over from death to life. The one who believes in me will never die, Jesus said. And those who die will live. What? How can any of this make sense? Ah, it makes sense when you realize if you die with Christ, your life is hidden with Christ in God. It is indestructible. Because who, who in all of the cosmos, the visible and invisible realms, can steal away what is hidden with Christ in God? Finally, in verse 4, when Christ, the anointed one, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life, now this is interesting, because we've read now that our life is hidden away with Christ in God, and now Paul pivots to an implication of that that is too good, that Christ is your life. This uh, harkens back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 20, in which Moses is speaking to the assembly of the true God of that time, under that covenant. And he said to that covenant people, Love Yahweh your God. Listen to his voice. And hold fast to him. For Yahweh is your life. Now, God had given the people of Israel at Mount Sinai an entirely new culture that they would have to abide by in his kingdom. Because he was literally setting up a kingdom for them to live in. With laws, with officials, with boundaries to it, right? I mean, they were actually going to be a nation now, not just a gigantic family. And in this kingdom, here's a certain culture, and the law would define that culture. And Moses is saying, love Yahweh your God, listen to his voice. Now, what was their option? If they didn't want to listen to his voice, what voice might they listen to? Well, they had a whole lot of voices they could listen to. All the pagan gods and goddesses of the people around them or the people that were behind them back in Egypt. They could listen to all kinds of voices. But Moses says, you need to listen to his voice. Hold fast to him. Do not let go of him and go grab onto some other God and be an adulterous people. Why? For Yahweh is your life. This is the exact same mindset that we see with Paul. It's a kingdom with a culture, and you need to embrace it and hold on to it. Seek it out. Because you have so many other options, and you know it. We live in a godless culture. There are myriad voices, and not all of them are obviously grotesque. Not all of them come at you as something shameful and profane. But they can still be godless. Why? Because they are not rooted in his kingdom culture and in his anointed one who sits at his right hand. There are things that pose as righteousness. They pose as knowledge. And scripturally we know they're false righteousness and false knowledge. 
So, let me repeat what Moses said so I can then turn to repeat what Paul said. Love Yahweh your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him, for Yahweh is your life. Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears or is manifested, then you also will appear or be manifested with him in glory. Now there's two ways to consider this final verse of our section here as I close out our time. Number one, this could be a really clear statement of anticipation that when Jesus comes again, when he appears in the sky, in the clouds, in what we call the second coming or the second advent, that we would already have died, let's say, and our spirits have gone to be with him in his heaven, and we come with him on his return so that he can give us our resurrected bodies. I mean, that's one way that Paul's description here could easily fit. We'll appear with him, like literally appear with him up there in the sky because we've come with him. We read in Revelation that in chapter 19, the rider on the white horse whose name is the Word of God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Gee, I wonder who that is. Right? He comes with the armies of heaven, dressed in white, riding white horses. Now, there's a lot of room to think that that's not only angelic, but also the human redeemed ones. Anyway, you know, you could picture it that way. When he appears, you'll appear with him in glory. Yeah, that checks that box. But there's another way. Because Paul didn't seem to assume that he would be dead when Jesus returned. He actually uses language to the Thessalonians that indicates he believes he'll be among those still alive, and they would be too when Jesus returned. It indicates that. We can't know for sure every minutia of Paul's thinking. But if that's the case, how could Paul be envisioning this? There is another way. That even if we're alive when Jesus returns... He appears in the sky. How is it then we will appear with him in glory? Because as Paul described to the Thessalonians, the dead in Christ will indeed rise first and, and receive their resurrection. But then we who are left, who are still alive, will be caught up in the air to meet them in the air and will be with the Lord forever. And we read in the book of Romans in the 8th chapter, that the creation itself is groaning, it's waiting for the sons of God to be, guess what, revealed. So whether you're already dead and coming to get your new body, or you're still alive and you're transformed into your new body, as you go to meet the Lord and His already deceased ones in the air, either way, you are being revealed manifested to all of the cosmos as the true children of God, vindicated at last, that you weren't throwing your life away, you weren't being a fool, that the wisdom of this world failed, not the wisdom of God. That when you looked like a Neanderthalic, unsophisticated nincompoop because you believed in what Jesus and his apostles said, you trusted in Yahweh, who is your life, and you clung to him. When you look like a nobody in this wise and sophisticated world, you'll be vindicated when you are revealed, manifested as a true son or daughter of God in the community of the beloved. See, that's why as those raised with Christ, those who have died with Christ, we are meant to seek here in this world, this tangible, mortal world, seek out the culture of God's kingdom and live in that culture. Not just your own self, but in the community of God's kingdom people. You're also meant to direct your mind purposefully to the things of God's culture, not to the things of earthly culture. 
I mean, didn't Paul say that you're supposed to have your mind renewed and not to be shaped by the pattern of this world, Romans chapter 12? That's exactly the point here. Direct your mind to the culture of the kingdom, not letting your mind be conformed to the pattern of this world. And when you do that, you're the kind of person who's living a life that's confidently hidden away with God so that you can do whatever he tells you to do without fear of losing, without fear of being left out or left behind. Because you have every confidence that the one who holds your life hidden away will preserve it until it's time for you and all who belong to Jesus to be manifest with him in real glory, vindicated at last. Just as Jesus had to wait to be vindicated, so must we. But oh, do we trust the Father to keep a promise just like he kept it to his son, that if he would die the death God called him to suffer, that God would raise him from death the third day to immortal glory. That's your hope and mine. But we still need to live in this world and be effective in this world. And so, brother, sister, seek after and direct your mind towards the things that are above of God's kingdom culture and not earthly things. For it's above that our master, our beloved, our life is seated at God's right hand. Amen. That concludes this morning's message, and I hope it was an encouragement to you and reminds you of the greatness of Jesus and the greatness of his love for you. Before we go, I want to invite you to join us each Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. as we gather as a church family here at 1437 Tyrone Pike in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. If you're a follower of Jesus, we'd love to continue to minister to you and help you become more like him, as well as invite you to minister to us with the gifts the Holy Spirit has given you. If you're someone who's still investigating, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, and why you should follow him. We would love to help you in that process as well. We also welcome you to visit our website at fcocpa.org, where you'll find many resources, both video and audio, that are designed to help you understand and follow Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you until next time. Bye-bye.